and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here this evening to an evening of celebration and discovery related to uh, arts, resilience, and social transformation. I'd like to acknowledge in beginning and in welcoming all of you that we are on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish people. And as a way of beginning, I'm very honored to introduce to you uh, Audrey Rivers, who is an elder in the Squamish Nation. She is a member of the membership committee. She has been involved in many blessing ceremonies around the Lower Mainland, including in the Olympic and Paralympic Games. And I was very excited to hear that actually, right now, there is a project of reclaiming the Squamish language and actually writing it down. It's been an oral tradition language. And they have now 8,000 Squamish words in the dictionary. Welcome, Elder Rivers. Honored guests, participants of the arts, resilience, and social transformation. And I welcome each and every one. <clears throat> I welcome you to Salish Territory. Vancouver is surrounded and shared by five Coast Salish nations. <clears throat> to the <clears throat> east, we have the Stolo and the Keitsi <clears throat> Nation. Uh, it's situated <clears throat> in the Coquitlam, S Simon Fraser area. And to the south, we have the <clears throat> Tawasin in the Ladner area. And to the west, we have the Mutskin in the UBC area of Vancouver. <clears throat> and to the north, we have the Tisklawit and the Squamish just right across for our unit. <clears throat> I wanted to mention too that there are approximately 20,000 20, First Nations people that come from the far north, like um, Alaska, Haida Gwaii, Haisla, Helsinki, Carrier. There's <clears throat> many nations from, from the northern part of BC, as well as the interior. And Vancouver Island, we have the Kwakwakula and the Nuchanas. And down to the far, <clears throat> the southern part of BC, we have the Salish. They come to Vancouver for many reasons, because many of them live in uh, isolated areas or villages. And uh, <clears throat> they come to Vancouver for uh, education, housing, employment and health. <clears throat> I just wanted to introduce myself for those of you that <clears throat> don't know me. My ancestral name is Kiel Talot. And three months ago, I had a gathering with our Squamish people and um, handed that my, my granddaughter shares that name with me, Kiel Talot. I'm the fifth generation, and she's the uh, sixth, the seventh generation to be carrying that name of my great great grandmother on my late father's side. <clears throat> I usually open my prayer to honor the three generations of the past, the present, and the future. I firstly <clears throat> honor our ancestors. Because of them, we are all here. I pray for our families, our leaders, and ask the Creator to continue to watch over them. I pray for the present and give thanks for this beautiful day and bringing you all here together for this special event. <clears throat> I ask the Creator to bless each and every one. I pray for the future our children, who will one day be our leaders. They'll also be the <clears throat> elders of this millennium. I pray that they will have a safe and a happy and a healthy future, or a healthy environment as well. <clears throat> so today, 
I honor the past, I'm learning in the present and applying to the future. For my closing prayer, <clears throat> I want to offer a Squamish prayer that was um, made up by Dr. My uncle, Dr. Louis Miranda, Chief Louis Miranda, which identifies the Abba, the Allah, and the Great Spirit. It's he who guides, protects, and provides. I ask the Creator, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> I, I, I wish, uh, ask the Creator to give you guidance in your discussions and solutions to bring you all here this evening. I give thanks for providing the resources also to bring you here this evening and to guide and protect you on your journeys, your life, and your future. At this time, I wish to honor and thank <clears throat> Dr. Robert Joseph. Yeah. He's also chief of the Kwakwakwila in the northern um, BC. <clears throat> and uh, I'd like to offer a prayer. Chingwin Mon Tomi Din Anha Squile. In Scope Mishnechum, that means thank you for this beautiful day. I know my family's going to get a chuckle out of this. Chingwin Mon Tomi. Which means thank you to our dear chief here, all my friends and relations. <laughs> and ask the creator to bless the remaining part of this evening. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to get this. Thank you very much, Audrey Rivers, and what a wonderful beginning for us to be mindful of where we are and the many gifts and the many stories that are part of this land. We'd like to also begin by giving thanks to the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies at the University of British Columbia and its director, Janice Sarah, for accepting an, an application that I made with my co-convener, Dr. Cynthia Cohen, who you'll meet in just a moment, to host an international roundtable, the first that the Peter Wall Institute has hosted on resilience, arts, and social transformation. We've been very fortunate to have 22 participants from many different parts of the world, as far away as South Africa, Tasmania, Kenya, and many other places with us for the last week really exploring these themes and thinking about complex social problems and how they can be addressed. And this evening, I know, is going to be a feast of some of the work of some of those participants and an opportunity also for you to engage and ask questions and learn more about their really exciting and, and world-changing work. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Cynthia Cohen, who is the Director of Arts and Peacebuilding at Brandeis University at the International Center for Ethics, Justice, and Public Life. I wonder why I forget the ethics word sometimes. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and uh, Cynthia is an international expert on arts and social change. She's a filmmaker, a scholar, a cultural worker, and I'm very, very proud to call her a friend. Thank you, Michelle. Can I switch with you, because this doesn't seem to be going on, so. Okay. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you for being here to um, share this conversation in a conversation with us about Arts, uh, social transformation, and resilience. Um, so I wanted to just give you a bit of context for our roundtable and for this evening. Many of us here at the part of, as part of the roundtable and uh, have been exploring for years, in some cases decades, how the arts can contribute to more whole, more less violent, more just communities how they can help to heal individuals and communities and societies and our planet. 
And um, I was very privileged from my home university at Brandeis to direct a program called Acting Together on the World Stage, which we um, collaborated with a group called Theater Without Borders in, in a seven-year inquiry that culminated in a, two anthologies and a documentary film and lots of important convenings and networks and relationships and collaborative projects that grew out of those. Um, and uh, three of the people who are core participants, actually four of the people who are core participants of the Acting Together project are here. And we do have a film, and I have some copies here, but rather than, but I screened it here, it was, it was screened here by the um, Peter Wall Institute last spring, and so we thought rather than just re-screen re the film, I would in invite some of the people who are in the film, who are here, to share with you some of their current work. Um, and um, so that's what we're going to do this evening. So, the, so we'll be hearing from three of the um, artists and peace builders from different parts of the world uh, and watching some clips of their work and then um, inviting two other members of the participant, uh, two other members of the round table to come up and join and respond to them and then engage in conversation with everyone. So that's kind of what we imagine for the next hour and a half. Um, Everything okay? Yeah? yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> good. We're, we're, going to, we're going to be praying to the technology goddesses this evening that everything is going to work just fine. Um, so, yes, and in this round table, I want to say we've been, so the Acting Together folks have been joined by people from Professor LeBaron's amazing networks and um, people here from UBC especially exploring art and social transformation into the, in relation to the theme of resilience. So we are kind of eager to welcome all of you into this conversation. So I would like to invite Diana and Marianne and Katrine to come here and um, we'll begin. <laughs> um, so let me just introduce these folks to you. Uh, Diana Milosevic will speak first. Diana is the co-founder and director of Da Theater in Belgrade, Serbia. And um, in our work in acting together, her, her theater company um, exemplified work in the theme of nonviolent resistance. And she'll tell you a bit about it, and then she's gonna share with you some very fascinating performances, I'll put that word in quote, from her community. Um, and then we'll hear from Marianne Hunter, who is uh, at the University of Tasmania in the Faculty of Education, yes, um, and has been, who's a special um, expert in um, areas of evaluation of arts and peace building, and in particular in relation to work with youth, and she'll be sharing with you some of the work that she's been doing lately. In the Acting Together documentary, her, um, you, you, if you choose to, if you can see it, you'd see work related to hip hop theater and youth in Brisbane, but she's gonna share with you a, a new project. And Katrine Fiyu is a playwright from New York City who um, has been working in many communities, but in, in particular in the Cambodian and Cambodian American community for decades. And um, we're actually gonna share um, a clip from the toolkit that accompanies our documentary about her work in the Cambodian community, and then she'll be talking with you about what she's been doing more recently. So, um, Diana, would you like to begin? In my language, I just said um, uh, good evening and welcome. And uh, Michelle and Cynthia, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity and inviting me to come here to share with all these incredible people this gift of time for those uh, I don't, five days, four days, yes. Um, I'm a theater director. Uh, I came from uh, Belgrade, Serbia. Once upon a time, it was Yugoslavia. Unfortunately, during the very violent conflict in the 90s, Yugoslavia split in many different countries, and now I live in Serbia. So this is, again, something that informs my work all the time. Uh, what is my identity? So uh, one of the questions that we explore a lot in my theater. Uh, I co-founded uh, the theater with colleague Jadranka Anđelić in 1991 
And um, the name of my theater is Dach, which means breath. And um, uh, from the very beginning, uh, because we started by coincidence at the same time where the civil war started in our country, we had to face this very, very important questions. And I'll share some of them. Uh, so like the, the question that we faced immediately was, what is the role of the artist in the dark times? And this is the title of the lecture actually that I'm giving, but this is only one excerpt that I'll show you tonight. Or can theater, can art, specifically theater, be a tool for peace? Do we have right at all to do art, to do theater, when people near us suffer enormously? What is the responsibility of us artists in the dark times? So all of these questions resonate in our work until today. We are a 21 years old group, and we created um, many projects, performances, different activities. Uh, but I will uh, speak tonight, or rather show you an excerpt uh, from the movie that speaks about the civil protest in Belgrade when uh, the members of my company and myself actually joined to our people on the streets. And we were simply doing actions with them. And so th that was the time, just to give you a little bit of context, because in the 90s, uh, our government then, led by uh, Milosevic, president then, uh, committed uh, really uh, atrocities, and they were leading country in the war after war. Uh, country was in economical collapse, uh, so it was all very tragic. Uh, thousands of people lost their homes, lives, the dearest ones. And people in Serbia were uh, caught in this kind of the situation that they didn't realize... Um, they, 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 we all felt very guilty, but most of the people didn't understand that actually we needed to transform guilt into responsibility and responsibility to transform into action. And in our case, we did it through theater. What happened at one moment in 1996, uh, 97 was that finally people got it and we had elections and uh, uh, more or less the majority of population voted against government but the government faked the results, and so again, they were in power. So in reaction to that, people went on streets of all our big uh, major cities, and this is the uh, excerpt from the happenings in Belgrade, and people started to show up, thousands of people every day, uh, doing completely peaceful actions. What was special about that protest was that the tools and the means that were people using were com completely artistic and theatrical, and artists were not ones who provoked those actions. Uh, those actions have been provoked by, uh, or uh, created and initiated by common people, citizens of the Belgrade. And, um, what was very fascinating uh, uh, about that was that every day thousands of people would come on the streets. Media were in denial. They were uh, totally uh, uh, misinforming what was happening. And so the only the source of information was word of mouth. And so this is how we were getting what would be the next action. And whoever wanted to initiate action would do that. And... Um, what was very fascinating to realize was because we were surrounded and we were facing brutal force of military and police every day that was from time to time attacking people, imprisoning people, injuring people and so on, was that people chose entirely peaceful actions, creative actions to oppose the brutal force. But those peaceful actions were actually full of humor. And this is something that our colleague Kichi today raised, like where is the place of the humor in the work of resilience. So this was an incredible example of uh, being um, resilient towards this terrible force that actually brutal force knew what they would do with protesters if protesters would fight them or beat them, but they were totally helpless and hopeless facing the humor of people. 
So just to, to give you a few examples, like one of the actions was because we were surrounded by uniforms, people in your uniforms, police and military, one of the actions was like bring your own uniform. And people would come like uh, one day, like the thousands of people would come finally dressed like in the soldier's boots and the funny wig, in the diver suit and the uh, police coat and so on, high heels and the military cap. And police was in shock. They didn't know what to do with us. Or then there was like one of my favorite um, actions was bring your own pet, because even pets understood that the government should leave the power. <laughs> so the people came, yeah, so the people came like, but massively, I'm speaking about thousands and thousands of people bringing their cats and dogs, birds in cages, even one horse was on the street. And so they were shocked. They, they didn't know what to do because also media, international media started to, to follow what was happening in the country and the government wanted to pretend that they were democratical. So like how to be democratical government and be finally, beat finally dressed people or people who are coming with pets. Or like one of the action was because at one point authority said like uh, you cannot be on the streets because you are blocking the traffic and it was clear that we cannot be only on the walk sides. So an action was uh, bring your own car, come by your car in the city center and then stop and repair the car. And so thousands of people would come and then they would open the hub and they would like, a policeman would come like, what are you doing, you're blocking traffic? And the person would say, oh, I'm sorry, like, you know, it just got broken, my engine, I can't move it. And the city was actually completely blocked, but information was spreading in that way. So now I will show you the part of the excerpt. It is the film by very famous uh, Serbian director Goran Marković, Belgrade Follies, about that protest. So can we please play this excerpt? And I will actually explain you a little bit. This very moment is happening when there is the cordon of police that is stopping people to move through the main street. And it's freezing. It's like uh, during a freezing winter for nine days and nine nights, people were standing opposing the cordon because symbolically it was very important to move it. And uh, they, they had shifts, so they were changing every two hours, but people stand for days and nights doing completely creative actions. It was lots of dancing, lots of dramming, um, different... Um, actions, whistles were the main tool or main, main weapon against police and people were coming really like with the families, with children wanting to show actually that we are coming in peace, that this is our city and that we want them just to move. So you can see babies, you can see older people, so it was not only young people and students but really like the majority of citizens of Belgrade. Uh, police, uh, we, we never knew when police would attack. So that was the very kind of the uh, tense situation. But people behaved as it was a huge party. And so people were, uh, huge solidarity was happening. People were bringing uh, pots of teas and coffee and uh, uh, shawls and uh, gloves to people standing so this you see so it, it was all like okay let's create this huge party in the face of this uh, brutality lots of drumming it was really very cold this guy was very brave Lots of dancing. Musicians, blow them away. Beauty contest in front of Cordon. And this is my favorite, you will see now, the guy that is totally confused.
So you can see the situation, thousands of protesters. And then it's a cordon. This is the main street in Belgrade, in my city. And it's a cordon of police. And then nobody. It's the theater group that decided to uh, perform Macbeth in front of cordon. So they were shocked. Sabina, how many more minutes I have? And you can see actually that uh, how people were in fact serious. Uh, drummers were really my heroes. They were drumming and keeping the good um, atmosphere for hours. But as I said, any moment could explode into violence. What's happened, what you're, what you're not going to see in this footage now because we don't have time was that eventually Cordon moved and uh, without violence, and it was the first big victory of that protest that uh, brought the seeds, actually, uh, of the change to our country, which in 2000, um, uh, like, finally got rid of the dictator. We got a new government, we uh, went towards the very fragile democracy, and unfortunately, again, like just a few months ago, we got the new government that resembles a lot to this one from the 90s. But the seeds of change that came from these protests are there. And I think they really create a difference. So can you please stop the video? Yeah. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Dihana. Thanks for showing me that. Um, that's extraordinary footage. Um, my name's Mary Ann Hunter and I'm from Australia. And first of all, I'd like to acknowledge um, the traditional owners and contemporary custodians of the land on which we're gathered here today. And I'd also like to convey my respect to elders past, present and future. Um, I've had the great privilege of working with some of the future elders um, in the Australian community, um, so with Aboriginal communities um, who are dealing with conflict both within their community and also cross-culturally um, with a number of um, uh, different kind of cultural groups who are beginning to learn how to uh, work together and live together and play together um, in peaceful coexistence. Um, and the basis of that work is, is actually shown in the, um, in the Acting Together video, uh, where I was a peace, it's called a peace dramaturg. Uh, my background is actually in drama studies and education studies. Um, and I worked with an organisation, I'm still working with them now, um, as we, we made up the term peace dramaturg, which was someone who could bring in both something of the peace and conflict studies field with the idea of drama and communication and how um, people work together in participatory, community-based work. Um, but today I've brought something different um, because I'm currently working in an education faculty and I currently work um, in, um, in the area of evaluation. So one of the things about th what we've been talking about this last week, and um, thank you to the um, Peter Wall Institute for Adv um, Advanced Studies to enable this opportunity. One of the things we've been talking about this week is social transformation and resilience. And for me, you can't talk about social transformation unless you talk about children and young people. So what I brought today um, is an example and a sharing, I suppose, of what's happening in the small island of Tasmania um, in, arts and, uh, in arts and education initiatives, which are offering the opportunity for young people to engage with the arts in a way that's actually transforming their everyday experience of lives that aren't necessarily um, uh, conducive uh, to building you know, building positive relations with each other and with the communities around them. So this is a this is actually a clip. It's of a it's from a program that I recently um, evaluated. It was a national program supported by the Australian government, uh, where there were 72 projects of artists in residences in schools. Um, so every project was very specific to the school and the community in which the artist was working. Um, and this is an example from a town um, which is about two and a half hours away from where I live in the small um, island of Tasmania. 
There are many, many other really diverse projects. Very happy to discuss it with anyone who may be interested um, later on about it. But I wanted to show you a flavour and bring, bring you a little bit of the um, of the, the earth and the sky and the water and the air um, of the uh, of the land in which I live and some of the children um, and young people that I've had the great privilege of uh, connecting with in my work in um, in engaging with the arts and uh, social transformation. So, could we? Rains too much, they think that seeding the clouds helps the dams. Yeah, you can't drink nice. our water. It's yummy. Yeah, yeah unless you yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It is nice actually. It's brown, but it's nice. Because it's the I'm just used to drinking yeah. that tap water, I'll drink it. But... Really, when we got here, we were so affected by the place. With the you know the mining landscape, the effect that that's had on the environment, and then and then the natural environment, which is they're so contrasting, and and that's quite a moving thing. Like I found that very affecting, and the isolation is also very affecting, and seeing the effect that the isolation has on a community, we essentially just went, okay, let's let this place seep into us and and see what comes of that. Art making for me is a process of discovery. It's really about searching. So while I can have some idea about where I want to get to, I actually enjoy the process of just going on the journey. And when you're an artist and you come into a new context, the way you worked before, the way you approach things before doesn't always hold true to where you are now. So there's always a certain amount of reinventing that has to go on. And that's what has been going on here, I guess. Mountain Heights School is situated in Queenstown, which is on the west coast of Tasmania. And the students at Mountain Heights School come from Zeehan and Strawn and Gormiston and surrounding areas. Many of our students um, have experienced trauma in their life. So students find sometimes participation in a regular school program quite challenging and so we provide lots of alternative programs for them to participate in. The AIR program was offered to all students in grade 9 to 10 so we held a student assembly where we um, offered the program to our grade 9 10 students and students could opt in. Well, basically what we wanted to do was sit down with the, with the students without any ideas of what we were going to do and we started to record their conversations and we'd, we'd ask them about their life in Queenstown, about the things they do, about things that happened to us and get them to explain why is it that there were rocks showering down on our roof at eight o'clock in the, in the night. If I was like trying to hit that building over there, I'd probably throw it from here because I can reach that. Because so by the time you throw it, you can you just walk. walk. You, got no idea right. you don't have to run, you can just walk off. Or if you run, oh, okay. you get to your hiding spot quicker. From those stories, we'd get little snippets, the Queenstown legends, the, the stories going around, and we would take those stories and then start to build upon them in a visual way. Just, just trying to find a, a visual equivalent for some of the stories that they've been talking about, so that it's not a foreign experience to themselves and so that the art that gets made still reflects them. When they came in we'd always have ideas about what we were going to do and then if that wasn't sort of feeling like it was really going anywhere we'd always change tact. That's been a bit of a new thing for them, that you can come into a space and go that's not working, let's try this, we can play with those ideas and, and then it turns into something. It was good to be able to just have a say in what you're going to do and what you're going to draw and you kind of forget everything else and you just know this is kind of the moment and 
this is just like what you remember all the fun stuff we did with everyone just making art. <laughs> I thought it would have been a bit more structured but then at the same time it's fun because you're thinking oh it might be like this but then at the same time it might be like that and it's not definitely going to be the one thing it could just turn in an instant so life isn't just a straightforward path that has deviations you might do one thing which leads to another thing but then that next thing could lead you to something completely different. When you wake up in the morning it's something to look forward to. Art isn't just painting a picture and it being spectacular, it's, it's more than that. We always look forward to it. We didn't look forward to school that much but on the days that we had this program, we always wanted to come so we could do that. I've just realised that it can be anything. It doesn't have to be drawing or painting, it can be movement, light, pictures, anything. They have often talked to Nick and Freya in quite detail about a variety of things and we've learnt a lot about, um, well I've learnt a lot about their thoughts about their school, about their community and about the arts just through their conversations. This opportunity has really just been a way of opening up all those new little paths and now I feel like when we, when we leave and we get our own studio again that we, that we just continue on all those little openings. The relationships that have been built here have been really significant I think in terms of my own learning working with the students has been a really a really important process in me exploring what I do um, the, and the second reason why I also wanted to bring this is that I've had the privilege over the last few days of sharing time with, with a number of artists whose work I, I have got to know over the last um, five to seven years through the Acting Together project and whose work I, I greatly admire. And one of the things I like about this video is that the young it actually communicates the impact that the young people had on the artists, how the artists' work in the future was going to be impacted on the engagement that they um, experienced and the new ways and, and kind of pathways into their own arts work that they experienced um, with those children and young people. So thank you very much and thank you for allowing the uh, space and time to share that with you. Thank you. I wanted to start by thanking you for your blessing and for honoring you. I, I am very happy to be here. Um, we're going to start with the toolkit that Cindy mentioned, and then after that I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it. Thanks. When the Khmer Rouge took over Cambodia, a number of things happened. They essentially closed down the borders, essentially enslaved the entire population, and we experienced destruction at every level of society. We also saw destruction of something that I believe to be the most important element of the country's soul, which is art and education. They blindfolded me for a long time. Suddenly they took off the blindfold and took my photo. Who are you? A photograph on the wall, like you. But T? Yes? You saw right. There was something at the bottom of my photo, a child's hand. 
they took off the blindfold and my daughter, she reached up to me. I did not move. They shot her first. I did not protect her. She reached up to me. I was born in the labor camp um, in 1976. It just you know, brings a chill to me to, to do this play and to realize that you know, things like this happens not only in my family, but in other families too. The reason I survived, I was stealing food from my neighbor and I saved my portion for my dad because I realized my dad and I am the only one that left to survive. So that's only a little bit my story to pass on to. Okay, uh, my turn. In 1975, uh, when the Khmer Rouge came into power, I... I would like to talk about the idea of remembering as a revolutionary act. Memory, in the case of people who suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, is very tricky because on one level, intrusive memories enter into your mind and they replay themselves. So there's the hope of not wanting to re-traumatize people that have survived genocide. But there's also the very, very deep hope of never again. And so there is the hope of needing to remember things that have happened. An example I would give is that in the schools in Cambodia now, the Pol Pot time, which is the Khmer Rouge regime, which lasted from 1975 to 79, is no longer taught in the schools. So we get this sense of how memory is a, is a dual entity that is very tricky to deal with. In the late 1980s, I started writing about Cambodian refugees who had arrived in the United States. And there were 150 Cambodian refugee women who suffered from psychosomatic blindness. This, is, uh, this first pack passage is uh, from the character of Tita San, who is the lead in the play. And she's a 50-year-old Cambodian refugee woman who's come to the United States to live with her brother. They tied own to a tree, a magnolia. They're forcing her to marry. The official, he unties her. He points to the young soldier. Will you marry him? She shakes her head no. She is stubborn. Will not accept. The official takes out his blade. They cut off her head. He throws it into a fire where a pile of corpses and body parts burn. Smoke got in my eye. Don't cry, don't cry, or they'll kill you. One of Tita's discoveries is to come to understand that her daughter was indeed extremely brave in what she did. Along the journey of all the research I did, are all the revolutionary acts that people did do, and they included saying no at every turn. You actually performed a lot of interviews with Cambodian women in the United States, and I was wondering how they reacted to the th your finished product. There's a lot of silence, and what I found interesting about theater is that it stood outside of politics. Every time that we would do these plays, afterwards people would just sit in their seats and uh, no one would leave. And so we started having discussions afterwards. And one of the things that it seemed that the play provided was a safe environment and that they could sit and meditate upon whatever it was in the play that they wanted to. And then use that as a way for having a discussion and that that was a way for also people to cry. The possibility of simply talking and remembering and telling stories was very uh, healing. Sit down.
ไอ้สไรปรกสดับจ้องประวัติขญมในเอ้ยกึ่นตะเพียบสาวพี่ในมีดตะภูมิยิงยิงรู้ขนมเพียบอนุกรุงนั่งเซไรเพียบ implicated in these issues because a lot of times we don't, Americans don't know a lot of things about these countries. But the thing that we do know is that we carpet bombed Cambodia and that created an imbalance. <laughs> My feeling of hope comes from the ability to learn to acknowledge. When I asked a Cambodian friend about this, I said, would it help if you got reparations? He just looks at me and says, the strong never apologize. And I think, in a way, that's where I'd like to leave this discussion. How do we negotiate that issue? Because I think that really actually is staring us sort of right in the face. Um, I was just going to say that in the chapter of the anthology that I wrote, I wrote about Yang Si Tol, who is the a uh, performer that was in the opera, Where Elephants Weep. He's a very well-known Cambodian uh, theater artist. And he's also um, uh, a survivor of the Khmer Rouge regime. Uh, and also Morm Sokli, who was the uh, woman actress in photographs from S21, uh, who is a, an amazing theater artist. Also, uh, she's a specialist in YK theater, which is a traditional form of of Cambodian um, theater, and also a survivor of the Khmer Rouge regime. And then also Him Sopi, who was the composer of Where Elephants Weep, who, was also, who is also a survivor of the Khmer Rouge regime. Uh, 80 to 90% of the artists in Cambodia died during the Khmer Rouge genocide. So uh, the, uh, I guess we could use the word resilience of, of those friends and colleagues is um, was exciting to feature in in the anthology. Um, I was just going to um, just mention a, a little bit about what I did this year. I just had a play done at La Mama in New York City, um, which is an amazing theater. And uh, it's a, it was called Luz, and it was L-U-Z, which means light in Spanish. And it was about uh, the uh, femicide in Guatemala, and uh, also dealt with Haiti. Uh, it, was a, it was more global than my usual work, uh, and I was very lucky to work with a composer from Guatemala whose name is Sergio uh, R. Reyes, who, uh, really helped me a lot in, in the journey of that play. And also my director, Jose Zayas, um, and I decided to do a portion of the play in Spanish, which was really exciting. Again, we, I've worked a lot with uh, multilingual text and, and found that that's an interesting way to work with audiences. Um, so I think I will leave it there and uh, look forward to, to talking to you more later. Thank you. Okay, well, so these are three incredibly rich examples of how arts are contributing to uh, the revitalization of communities and um, the resistance of abuses of power and, um, and to resilience um, and reconciliation. Um, so we've invited two additional members of the round table to um, respond and open this uh, for conversation. So Kiche and Kathy, would you come forward? Um, 
first we'll hear from Kiche Magak, Dr. Kiche Magak, who is um, a lecturer at the University, uh, Maseno University in Kisumu, Kenya, who, um, among other things, collaborated on an international soap opera with a colleague, um, Kate Gardner, and that work is described in the Acting Together project. But he's a, he's, as he will tell you, or, or I will tell you, that he does all things community, um, health and education and development of various kinds, and is, um, I would say, a beacon of integrity in his community, and um, uh, has been participating with us in the round table this week in very, very, um, profound ways, really, the stories that you've shared. And uh, this Kathy Susloff is someone I don't know from Acting Together, so I need to just refer to a few notes. Um, Kathy Susloff is a professor of art history, visual art, and theory at UBC, and a member of the Peter Wall Institute of Advanced Studies. She's published books and articles in the fields of performance studies, photography, art theory, painting, sculpture, photography, and film. In Vancouver, she, she's on the board of the Live Vancouver Performance Art Biennale. And before coming to Vancouver two years ago, uh, Catherine taught at the University of California, Santa Cruz, for 24 years, where she held a UC presidential chair in visual and performance studies. And I also want to say, Catherine, that your voice has been such an important one in the round table. So thanks to both of you for just reflecting a bit on the stories that you've just heard in light of the, um, our discussions at the round table and your, and your own life experiences and your disciplines. So we agreed, Kathy, I think that you would go first, yeah? Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Um, it's been a real honor and also a bit of a shock to be part of this group. I wasn't part of the original group as, as you just heard, but also to be with artists from all over the world and people who are working basically with communities from all over the world. Um, it's really opened my eyes a lot to the many different methods and ways of thinking about art that really aren't very open in most areas of, of North America, I'd say. That we're not really aware of this kind of work in many ways and I think it's really important that you three and and Kiche as well, and, and many members of the of our workshop have been doing this work and have opened my eyes, and I think will open many other eyes as well. So I just want to say, one thing I find so valuable is social documentation in this kind of work. So these films, for instance, and clips, and testimonies are really significant for this work. First, to understand it, because so much of what we what goes on isn't known by anybody except the artists and the communities involved at the time, and, and nor should it be in many cases. But then later, for us to understand what happened and how to do more of this kind of work and where to do it, those things uh, come across in social documentation. And it's a really a great thing to think about in conjunction with all the work together. And um, I think that's really, uh, significant to sort of put into our mix. Um, and uh, so we shouldn't just do the art and we shouldn't just think about how we do it and where we do it, but you also need to document it and make that really part of a, the entire process. Um, because that's the only way it's gonna get known to more and more people and that's really important. Um, I had a number of thoughts throughout the, uh, throughout the week and I wanna just say that I'm trying to s touch on some things that might resonate with you after hearing our artists tonight and after looking at the, f at the film clips and, and uh, seeing the dance on fairness, if you were here for that as well. Some of these issues do overlap. Um, but there's a lot more to say than I could possibly say now and also there's things that you will have thought about that I won't have. Uh, thought about myself and that is one of the exciting things about doing research with artists and in an interdisciplinary group. So one of the things I really came away with is that we, we tend to think of art in the first case as an individual project, as a project of a creator, as the project of 
someone who has inspiration and who is um, has training in many, most cases and who has experience in what they make. But the other thing that we need to always put in the mix if we're going to have social transformation or social justice with art is that it, to always remember that it can't only be individual, that it has to be relational. And for my take on it, it's the relational community-based issues that are the most important and I would say original parts of our projects or of your projects. They're not really my projects, but our projects, I guess. So that is really significant. And this term relational has been used a lot in regards to art in the last 10 years, in regards to the kind of art that people install in museums and, and put on gallery walls. And I think that's a real um, disservice to what relational art really is. Because relational art has to speak to communities. It can't speak to everyone, it has to be speak to communities. And communities tend to be local, not universalized, not all the same. They tend to be diverse. They tend to have specific needs and specific histories. And I think that that has to be kept in mind. And I think our group made that really clear to me and to each other. I think we all made that clear to each other how important the local situation is. So just to bring it right back home to Vancouver is, because I'm the Vancouver person here on the panel, is to say that um, there was this wonderful uh, event that took place a couple of weeks ago in Vancouver for, for four days called Institutions by Artists. And some of you might have been there and some of you might have heard of it. Um, I think you can um, just Google it and probably find clips and all kinds of doc social documentation of that. Uh, artists who run institutions and who make art for communities in art institutions all over the world came together uh, and came from across Canada and all from all over the world to talk about how do artists make things when they do it for themselves? Well, how do they make connections with audiences? How do they make connections with their communities? How do they make their situations in their local um, context important for others? And how is this kind of work funded? And what are the upsides and downsides of different forms of funding? Because that's really important. And who supports these kinds of institutions, either with, uh, let's say, ethical support or moral support, but also with financial support? So those are some issues that came up in the Institutions for Artists conference that I think converge really well with our conference or our workshop, which was on social change. And I think there's a lot of overlap. Um, so that's basically kind of covering my, my thoughts about uh, the conference so, um, and the workshop. So now I'm gonna hand it over and then I hope we'll have questions and discussions with, with you all. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Kiche. I come from Kenya. And because I come from Kenya, that means my accent might be a little strange. So should you not quite get what I'm saying, please feel free to just, then I'll try to repeat what I said. Um, having said that, where I come from, when you are in the midst of elders, like our elders here, you ask their permission first to speak. So I would like to ask your permission. Do I have your permission to speak? Do I? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Cindy was getting a little worried over there. <laughs> yeah, mm. there, there, there's, there's so much to say just from the three clips that you've seen. And uh, there is so much to react to from what Kathy has just said. So when we do performances in my country, my instinct would be not to speak, would be to get it to the audience and ask them, what do you think? And ask them to react to it. Um, unfortunately, this is not the design of this particular evening. So um, we will comment just briefly, but still I will ask Cindy's indulgence so we can sneak to the audience and let's hear their reactions too. Um, 
when I was looking at the three uh, clips, I kept wondering what is it that these gentle ladies keep doing what they do? And um, of course I was there so I didn't ask them. So I thought maybe because there is something that tie all of us together. There is something innate in human nature that if something is going wrong, if it is Cambodia, if it is New York City, if it is South Africa, if it is Tasmania, people kind of react the same way. And the easiest way to react is through performance. Where I come from, performance is not separate from things that we do. When I get up in the morning, I sing, I dance, I perform, it is, it is one whole thing. Excuse me. So maybe that is why art speaks to, art, to us so easily. Because in this audience, I'm sure we, we are people from all sorts of backgrounds. We have engineers, we have people who deal with people's heads. What are they called? Psychologists, thank you. We, we have all sorts of people in the audience. Yet, there is something, even in psychology, that is artistic. Because if there is no artistry in your psychology, then you can't be a very good psychologist. If there is no art in your engineering, then you cannot be such a good engineer. And because art speaks to all of us as human beings, it doesn't matter where you come from. You come from Kenya, you come from wherever, art speaks to you. And maybe that is why we are here. And to answer my question, why do these ladies do what they do? I think the answer is simple. They do this because they're human. That, that's, that's the answer. They are human. And then the other question is, what is it that other, humans, other human beings do that make it necessary for this other human to do this thing in, to reverse what they are doing? Yeah. In fact, there's, there's, an, there's an African writer called Chinua Achebe. He's Nigerian. And Chinua Achebe asked this very simple question that I keep asking every day. And the question is, where did the rain start to beat us? You know, somewhere the rain it started raining, maybe because it's African, it doesn't rain so much down there. But he's asking, where did the rain start beating us? Where did we start going so wrong? I think we started going so wrong when we became obsessed with acquisition. Because we want, to, we want to acquire everything for ourselves. And art has a way of releasing us from that greed, from that, that, that feeling of you want everything for yourself. You know, When you acquire this house, you need the next jet. When you acquire the next jet, you want to take the next trip to, to the moon, tourism. So it never stops. Maybe art has a way of releasing us from this sense of wanting to own everything. And I think that is why these gentle ladies and us do what we do. Um, sometimes artists are treated very casually. Little, these are people who are not serious. These are people who are just, you know, they are, they are, they are, they are just laughing around and doing stuff. I think it is time for us to start taking artists seriously. And I'm not thinking of artists as these people who are sitting here. I'm thinking of artists as everybody sitting here. Because we had already agreed that art lives in all of us. So if we take ourselves seriously, then I think together as human race, we can move forward. Maybe I'll stop there for now. And maybe, maybe very, very, very quickly before, before I, I leave, to ask my sisters here, they, they could be my sister, couldn't they? <laughs> <laughs> sister from a different mother. Uh, okay, I would like to ask my sisters here, um, what, what is it in the work that you've shown here that you see connects them? 
maybe that's something you've not think about. You don't have to answer it, but if you can just quickly think of what do you think connect the work that you've shown here. That if uh, Diana was to come to New York City, would do a Cambodia. If Tasmania had to come to Belgrade, what, what is it that really connect the work that we do? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I, I think for me it is definitely the connection is the wound. And I think this is the wounds that we are working from a lot. But then how uh, to go, how to move from the wound to the light. And it was very obvious in your examples and I guess also in the examples of the people on the streets of Belgrade. What you said was so beautiful, Kiche, and I, I just wish we could have it on video. <laughs> Maybe we do. Um, uh, you, humanity uh, is what connects us, and, and love, love. Um, we've been in the presence of this beautiful soul and wordsmith for, for some days, and I think um, the, the ability to synthesise it in exactly what you said around, um, around if we take the heart seriously, um, then that's the humanity. And for me, it's the humanity in institutional life, which, you know, which is really important. We'll put this one down. Thank you. Thank you very much to the three of you and Kathy and Kiche also to you for the comments you've made, for the things you've shared, really from your hearts and minds. Thank you so much. And we do have a few minutes to hear questions, comments, things that you would like to share with or ask uh, any of the people here about. Please, go ahead. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Karen Joseph, and I'm actually joining here, you here today um, as a representative of Reconciliation Canada. And um, I was really moved by the work that you've done and the words that you've shared. And I really appreciate Freitas for, for inviting us tonight, for having the foresight to uh, recognize that this was a place that we needed to be. So. So thank you. I'm sad that uh, we, we haven't been present during the dialogue up until this point. Um, my, I have a question for you, and it's for everybody in the room, which is why I'm, which is why I'm trying to, to look at you as well. We are in the process of reconciliation. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada has gone unnoticed, unmentioned, unacknowledged, and really, uh, Canadians have kind of slept walked, as has the rest of the world, through our process of, of reconciliation here in this country. And so I'm here today, and, and we have to leave soon because we, we need to pick up our children. But um, we're, we can be found at reconciliationcanada.ca. And we need to share this story before it comes here to Vancouver in September of 2013. And so we're, we're putting on a year-long engagement strategy. We're trying to get the awareness. Reconciliation Canada, from the government's perspective, is done after that. It's a checkbox. Next. And it's been going on now for almost four years, and you've barely heard about it anywhere in the world. And so I really ask you and the people here to help us find a way to get this message out and, and to portray uh, that humanity that we're talking about because those really are our pillars of understanding. And so I apologize that we, we had already made arrangements to pick up our children and we can't, we can't abolish that responsibility. So uh, please contact us and, and we, we ask for your help in, in trying to, to move this message forward. Heitschka, Gela Kessler. I've taken a look at this website and it's really impressive and there are a number of really exciting activities planned. Thank you very much, Karen. 
Other comments, questions from anyone? I think it's, as Kiche said, it's hard to, to bring words in the face of, of so much poignance and so much powerful work, and, and your voice is also speaking about it. Yes, please. Thank you very much. I'm very moved. And I just have a question. I think it's actually related to Karen's remarks and questions, too. Of, uh, I mean, I'm originally from the States. I'm a student here in Canada right now. And I've heard it said that um, the Occupy movement and all the uh, gatherings that have been worldwide in the last 18 months or so, um, but I've heard this analogy made that, you know, we can't really quite get going here in Canada and in the States with these movements, although Quebec's situation perhaps is a little different because they have gotten some action out of their gatherings and their protests. But I was struck by your footage of Belgrade and it being um, before the millennium and we forget, you know, history moves on and so I also appreciated the lady's points about memory and, and how important it is to remember. And but I've experienced that to be true, and your footage of Belgrade just reminded me of how it seems like with the Arab Spring and your situation in Eastern Europe, that um, the people were more motivated for change because they had lack, and that part of our issue here in Canada and the US is that we really don't have enough of a lack, although again, and I know they've just left, but that's compared to the situation of many of the indigenous people who very much do feel that gap. Um, so I don't know if, I feel like, I'm sorry, I'm very tired, I don't know if that made sense, but do you see any way in which we can bridge that basically it's our ease and our comfort and our privilege that maybe we intellectually are troubled by things, but how do we actually bridge that gap of we don't lack enough to actually have our lives affected such that we stay in the street or we even somehow feel enough to fight for someone else's children. Do you know what I'm saying, any of you? Or <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, yeah, I think it's a very, very important question. I would, I would refer to this burning uh, something to the wound that you have to see what is, wh what is it in you that really moves you out of the safety zone, out of the zone that where everything is okay. And I think it is very personal, extremely personal. And then when it is really personal and you connect with that and do an action, then it becomes very political and it matters to the community as well. A, a big question. Um, I, I would say we are doing so much. I mean, we've spent this past these past days talking a lot about all the work that is being done, and and I think in a way maybe we lack. It might it might not be uh, um, in material things, but we our society lacks in so much, and we are anesthetized, I think, on some level by that great, great pain. Um, and, and so I think in a way we have to f forgive ourselves uh, f and, and, and move from there. And, and I think that we are all here, every single one of us right now, for that reason. And we will act. I, I do believe that we will and that you will. Thank you. Um, I have a, a little story to share. Um, I'll make it very brief. Um, in 2007, Kenya was plunged into a very violent post-election violence. Uh, maybe some of you can remember that. And uh, when I saw the Belgrade policemen being given flowers, it reminded me of what happened in Kenya. 
sometimes we forget that even police are also human. And because we do not treat them as human, then they treat us back badly. Um, in, in Kenya, when I went back to, I was, I was in New York when the violence erupted. When I went back, it was a long process. When I got back home, I found, because the violence took uh, ethnic dimension, so it was really bad. So when I went home, I found the people from other communities in my town. In my town, I'm coming from a community called Luo. In that town, that is the majority. So the non-Luos in that town were really being persecuted, and they were in churches, they were in police stations, and it was like four, five, going to one week, staying in those police stations and churches, and they didn't have any food. And for over one week, the policemen have been engaged in running battles with young people. And actually, it's, when they say young people, it's just young men, really. The, the, the girls are at home. And um, because I knew some of these policemen, they started asking me because we were looking for, we were trying to mobilize food to take to the police station so the people who were marooned there could eat. It was so surprising that the police did not even have food. So the food that you are taking to the people in the, in the police stations and the churches, the policemen were also asking for this food. So when I saw those flowers, it reminded me that sometimes maybe if we treated the policemen and women with more humanity, then they, they might even stand against the system that sent them against us. Because surely in my town, when we started treating the policemen nicely, giving them food and talking to them as human beings, the violence almost ceased overnight. And so I think it is time for us, especially in violent situations, to start thinking of how we interact with policemen. Okay. Thanks very much. Any other comments from here? Shall we see if there's one or more, two more questions, and then we'll bring our evening to a close. Rena, thanks. Hi, thanks. I'm not sure how well I'm going to articulate this, but I'll try. So um, one of you, woman from Belgrade, said that the thing that's in common is uh, the wound. And uh, so, so I see your work as an amazing healing process. And I'm very struck by what Karen said about the TRC. The, um, and so what I'm wondering is how do you get people who don't share the wound or don't know that they share the wound <laughs> Um, to care and to participate. And, and I'm, I'm wondering, particularly in the work uh, uh, with the Cambodians and, and the work with the, the children from Tasmania, like what, um, how do I say it? Um, so, well, I'm thinking maybe particularly with the, with the work with the Cambodians, like who are the who's the audience? And how does, it, how does it impact those who aren't sharing the wound? I don't know how to, who was the audience for, for the pieces or, um, well, uh, Where Elephants Weep was, was produced in Phnom Penh and uh, it, it, was, it was an amazing project just because it, it united a lot of different cultures and also different age groups. Uh, but actually when it went on television, it was broadcast on TV it once and then the second time it was, after that it was banned. Uh, the, the government banned uh, it from being shown again, um, which is interesting because I think it shows that uh, the power of, of certain kind of art can, can seem dangerous to, to a government. Um, I guess one thing that comes to mind in terms of the wound is I, I believe that if people knew, uh, for example, if they were aware of the carpet bombing that happened in Cambodia, if they actually just simply listened, like I have listened to Cambodian people explain how the bombs 
went over their their villages and they fell on on like for example people in the middle of a wedding ceremony or or just on on daily life and then these massive craters happened and then it rained and then malaria came i mean i think that history is is something that can be instructive in letting people share in the story. I, I think maybe sometimes people just don't know what happened. And so they're not able to understand their responsibility. And, and it, I, I think that I'm not talking about every, people f need to feel guilty, but I, I think they need to simply know um, so I think that that can be helpful. I mean, the work that I've done in Lowell, Massachusetts, for example, which has uh, one of the largest Cambodian uh, populations in the country, um, I think that people get to know the situation because they're together. So I don't know if that helps. I'm just talking from a, a different sort of context, but it, it may have... Um it may have relevance to, to the question you're asking, and that's around multi, multiple audiences. And that comes with um, documentation, particularly with participatory um, arts practice that, that have been engaged in an Australian level. So I just want to give you a quick example. Um, Contact Inc is a, an organisation I referred to before that works in um, suburban areas of Brisbane and Queensland um, in Australia. And what they started doing were very closed community-based projects. So. Um, they would enclose for good reasons in terms of being of creating kind of safe space for um, young people from different cultural communities to share stories within their own cultures and then sharing the, those stories across cultures. The next year of that same program or that same and it's, I hate calling it a program because it wasn't a program. It was a it, it was an evolution of the practice of the community and the artists who were working from that community. The next year, they did the same kind of process, came up with a, a performance which then they shared with that regional community. So it was kind of like the evolution of the next step was that the audience around them, so the intergenerational aspect um, then kind of came into the communication of what they were experiencing. The following year, they did it again um, and they walked through it again and this time they recorded it really high quality, really good aesthetic quality video and it was, it was really... Um, it was really bringing those really excellent, and we've been talking about excellence a bit, a, a bit this week, they're really bringing excellence in terms of a kind of cultural practice into their work as well. And what they did with that video was bombarded every government agency that had anything to do with those, the care of those children, uh, the care of those young people and the care of that community, uh, including the police. So there was a... Whether it was strategised right from the beginning, I wish I could say, yes, we thought that was a really great strategy right from X, but it was actually the way it was evolved and it exactly kind of addresses your question and kind of is a, re a little bit relevant to the question before, and that is recognising where the, or where the people who need to know this stuff are at and meeting them, kind of being prepared to meet them a little bit halfway, unless you're kind of... You know, the Australian term is kind of pissing on your own patch. And, you know, these kids didn't want to just piss on their own patch. They wanted the, they wanted the people who were, you know, who were making decisions about their schooling and about their just, you know, what happened when they got into, uh, into the youth justice system and were having to be in detention. They wanted those people to know. So, but time is such a crucial, you know, it's relational. It's got to do with time. But just a quick example. I've got a question over here. It's a, it's a follow through and maybe if I can ask it because it, it relates very closely to the last one. It's, it just sort of turns it another way. Um, and it, it uh, was a question that's been uh, forming in my mind throughout the evening. I'm interested in how uh, when art arises out of trauma, uh, in what cases it is about knowing and on the other hand, when can it be about healing? And I think that was sort of the nub of the question over here also. Um, so when art is about knowing, it can be about expression, it can be about testifying to events that happened, it can be about informing the public or a wider public, or it may be about informing 
the person who experienced the, the trauma by bringing it to a clearer state of focus. Uh, so there's, there's knowing on the one hand, and we can think of that also in terms of truth. Okay? I'm thinking about uh, the previous speaker and, and the Truth and Reconciliation Committee and process. On the other hand, art needs to be about healing and sometimes really is about healing, and in that case, it's about reconciliation. So coming to those two words once again. Mm -hmm. I'm interested to know from all of you, and I'm interested really in the reconciliation part, and I'm thinking in terms of Kiche's uh, metaphor, when can art be the kind of food that can, f can feed both sides of the trauma so it can bring them together? And if any of you have examples or uh, something to offer along those lines. I would just like, but it is very connected with the previous comment or question. I think that art and theater have this unique possibility to go straight to human hearts. I mean, it's about compassion. And this is something, so we don't even need to understand language often, or, uh, and we, we get it. So this is one, one side. And then uh, another is really like uh, art and theater uh, confront denial. Uh, directly, so it's really about, but in a very uh, kind of the um, uh, heart-opening way, and this is my experience with with our performances. And and for example, when I was because it's a big difference: are we doing propaganda or are, are we making art? And when I was reading uh, uh, a lot about uh, Pol Pot's regime in Cambodia, and of course I was terrified and uh, intellectually I, I, I uh, took part into thinking about that, but when I really got it, uh, got what, 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 what is the enormous of, of that, what was happening there and what could be effects and what could be the healing was when I saw uh, Catherine's piece. And this is, uh, so all books that they read or, or, or footages did not cause that kind of effect. And I think this is something that is very, very, uh, I mean, very, very important, very special about art. So. There are many, many examples like that. I mean, uh, I, uh, and also theater specifically creates the space where we, uh, that we share and where we can really meet in, in totally big, big differences, and where we can laugh as well together. You, you asked for an example, and I was thinking of this in the, question, the previous question as well. So I'll just give this example about the power of art. First, I'll make the, reserv uh, the, the observation that I think the rise in performance art and performance practices in all of the global cultures that we've talked about, including Canada and the United States, in the last 15 years has to do with this desire for what these practices can give us. A lot of them have been, we've seen in the pieces we saw tonight. Um, there is a need for us to, to have this kind of work, and that's why we see it so predominant in culture now, performance art and performance practices is what I would say. The, se the, the second thing that I, I really think is important is this example that came up at the Institutions for Art uh, uh, conference in the first uh, session that I attended. Uh, uh, an Aboriginal woman named Skeena Reese, who's a very well-known artist in Vancouver, performance artist, was invited to attend. Her performance consisted of bringing her child, she's still nursing her child, nursing her child in public, pushing the cart, with their child in it around, asking people if they would be comfortable changing the child's diaper. In other words, pushing her situation, the situation of her people as marginalized, as on the street with their children, women who have nowhere to go. She was changing her clothes and dressing in clothes that she'd found on the street and talking about this during the, during the, the conference, during the, the papers and during the discussions. and. It was an incredible intervention. It was uh, not noticed by everyone because, you know, don't look at it and it won't be there. The other thing was, it, with the people that noticed it, some of them thought it was so powerful, like me, I'm one of those obviously, I thought it was such an intervention by a performance artist about a situation that's local. Um, but also, uh, it was, uh, 
there were others who just thought it was, they didn't understand it. Now what's this street person doing here, you know? So I think that, you know, if we can pull those kinds of moments out, we might have more of an answer to your question, Richard. Um, in Kenya, we have something called Reconciliation Justice, uh, Justice and Reconciliation Commission. It is heavily funded by the government. It has been going on for the last three or four years. It is not working. Because people are not even going to testify over what happened because so many of such commissions have been formed before and nothing comes out of them. So people are already disillusioned. What seemed to be working, this is a roundabout of a way of responding to your question. What seemed to be working is communities getting together, elders of the communities getting together and performing. Eating together, singing together, dancing together and agreeing that we are not going to butcher each other anymore. I think what really we need is genuine human connection. Art provides us with a perfect excuse to connect as human beings. Maybe we have not discovered other avenues of really connecting, so art so far is what really gives us the, the platform to connect. Um, what I'm seeing down in Kenya is this really grand designed government uh, commission to reconcile people is not working. But because people are eating together, people are singing together, people are dancing together, people are dr drumming together, the fights are lessening. So I think if we can promote art for genuine human connection, maybe, just maybe, we have a chance as a human race. So thank you for sharing the feast with us, the feast of this past week that uh, we've had the privilege of, of enjoying at the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies at UBC. We'd like to very much thank Dr. Janice Sarah, the director of the Peter Wall Institute, who's here with us tonight. Very much thank Joe Forbes, also from the Peter Wall Institute, who really made all of these uh, trains and films and all sorts of other moving pieces work, not only tonight, but all week, and has been extraordinarily amazing in all respects. Also, Andrew Diltz and Megan Coyle, who are here with us, who also did tremendous work in helping this all come about. And all of the roundtable participants who came and have given so much of their time and their energy to, uh, to work on all of these initiatives, only some of which you've heard uh, small bits about. So we look forward to continuing this work and uh, to continue continuing these conversations with you. And uh, for the last word, uh, back to Cindy Cohen. Okay. Well, I want to echo my thanks to the Peter Wall Institute and also my dear friend and colleague, Michelle. It's been really a privilege to be part of this round table and to work with everyone. I want to just say, just sorry, I can't, the educator in me just can't resist um, <laughs> that, uh, there are a few things we did really learn about, about performance and reconciliation in the Acting Together project. We, one, of the, one of them was that in the several indigenous communities whose performances we were part of the project was that history was addressed through ritual, but always in the context of building relationships that move to the future. I think there's really enormous wisdom in the indigenous communities that we are all privileged to have to, to, to be able to connect to still about how reconciliation can happen through performance. And I also want to, um, so therefore I just want to suggest to you, shameless plug, to take a look at Acting Together, our anthologies in the film. There's a lot of material there and also an online anthology, Recasting Reconciliation, that has work, includes work from another one of our roundtable participants, Kim Berman, who's been working with art and reconciliation in South Africa for a long time. Um, there's a lot that we know, and I guess I would just say that I think as a species, we're only beginning to learn about reconciliation. We're at the baby, kindergarten level, 
And one of the things that we need to uh, understand, I think, is that it's a long process that includes mourning and grieving and seeking, and seeking justice and letting go of bitterness and imagining a new future. And the arts can really contribute to all those things. Um, and I, I really appreciate the examples that we've had tonight for um, sparking these questions and this conversation. So thank you all. <laughs>